Hello and welcome to GM Tips, a show where my friends and I share with you our thoughts and suggestions on how to game master your role playing game. I'm your host, Satine Phoenix, co creator of Maze Arcana and a dungeon master for D&D. Today's theme is psychology at the table. Tabletop role playing is more than just fun and games. It can be a powerful tool to help people with life. People can learn to relate, socialize, and interact with others. I didn't realize it so blatantly at the time, but as a kid, while all these terrible things were happening to me, I was able to build the courage to leave a terrible situation by becoming the strong character I was playing. I got to defeat monsters in the game, which gave me the relief I needed in the real world. Even after the trauma was over and the aftershocks felt debilitating, it was Dungeons and Dragons that helped build the skills I needed to stop being depressed. I had a group of people that I was now responsible for and who felt responsible for me. Together, we went on missions to save or find things which gave us a sense of accomplishment. It created new memories that ended up becoming more a part of who I am than the trauma itself. Put simply, Dungeons and Dragons helped me through my PTSD. How exactly can a role-playing game help people through issues or challenges one experiences in life? I could roll on, but instead, let's discuss this with writer, teacher, and lore master of Stoneblade Entertainment, George Rockwell! Hey! Yay! I made it! Yes, you did! I'm so excited. <laughs> I'm excited you're here. I'm excited we're discussing what we're discussing today. I've been wanting to talk about this for a really long time, so thank you for being the guy that I'm talking about this with. <laughs> Well, actually, it was kind of, you're like, hey, can I do this? Yeah, I wanted to. <laughs> I was excited. Well, it's important. And a lot of people, it's a big thing that people keep asking. And almost every game master I know talks about it, but needs help through it. Mm -hmm. Until you have a lot of character deaths and you have a lot of experience with people crossing boundaries, it's very scary and it's emotional for you as a game master. So why don't we talk about... Um, why you wanted to talk about it? Well, I think character death is something that can be valuable for a lot of different types of stories. It's not valuable for every story, but there are quite a few stories where it can be used and it can really make that adventure even more powerful. I, I think of um, moments like in the, uh, in the Avengers when Coulson gets killed and it brings the team together. Yeah, right? yeah. Or like Wolverine dying at the end of Logan, where it's like, oh, you know, he died saving Spoilers. those kids, right? Yeah, I think I they've seen it. The Everyone who's watching this has seen that stuff. <laughs> <laughs> no, but that's a really good point because it is a part of it. How do you communicate with the player or do you communicate with the player? Do they want to die or do you just kind of set it up that if they die, then you use it for the story? Well, I think there are a few ways to do it. Um, so there's one which is where I have someone who's really invested in the story and they come up with the idea like there's this great time that they could have a heroic death. And so we talk about it. There's a bit of metagaming to it where I go like, okay, like how do you see it happening? Um, you know, this will be the cue and we'll lead up to it. And then the character will die and it'll become part of the story. And maybe we even resurrect that character as part of the story later on or there's a ghost or something like that. Depends on the story you're telling. Um, another is where a character is acting really foolhardy and gets killed. Um, it's a lesson for you, guy. <laughs> um, yeah, exactly. But it, but it happens, right? So you're looking for that place between uh, foolhardiness and cowardice. That is courage, right? And yeah. that's when I won't kill the character, you're unless like they that. like want that. Um, where they're they're kind of going out of their way to, um, they're going out of their way to save the day. But it's like a calculated risk, and it's something that's in character. But the foolhardy part, that's like people just don't think that they're going to die. They think that yes. you're going to be safe and you're going to protect them as a game master because you've been playing for however many months or years or weeks or whatever. They're safe. This is just a game. This right. is just Dungeons and Dragons or Pathfinder or Cthulhu or what? Well, not Cthulhu, but <laughs> you know, like <laughs> right. it's a safe place. And because you are friends, there's no way that you would kill them. Right. And and yet it is an emotionally difficult thing for a lot of people to have their character killed when it happens. Yeah. So I think that um, one of the things that I like to do is set the tone of the game before we even start playing. So I talk to them about what kind of world we're in. I always tell them it's way harder than it actually is. So like I go <laughs> like, look, this campaign was made for four players. There are only three of you here. 
there's a good chance you'll die if you don't think strategically. Uh, when I say think strategically, I, I also mean think strategically in character. How would your character approach this situation? And remember, to you sitting in this room, it's not a life and death situation. To your character, it is a life and death situation. Yeah. Right? So how does that character respond? But also that, that uh, uh, setting up the game by saying something like, you know, this is going to be really difficult. There's a good chance you can die. Um, gets them working together as a team. They start to recognize that it's not about the individual character, it's about the, the party. Mm -hmm. It's the party's story, not your individual characters. That's just part of it. Because you can play a video game for that right. if you wanted to, but that's not what these things are about. And it's interesting, we all know that you could die when you play a role-playing game, but when you're in it, right. you just you forget. Yeah. You're like, oh, it's just a thing, and then if I do this and that, so uh, what are other things in the pre-game that you can do as a game master to set up emotionally or um, m uh, other ways for them to realize the danger? So uh, let them know what it looks like mechanically to die, right? Like here are the rules for death in this game. So they know when they're going down that path. Um, and they can like think a little bit more and the rest of the group can think about how to save them. They like know how far down the path, because some people just won't remember what those rules are. They act, they don't come up quite that often. Yeah. <laughs> so like you just need a reminder and I like to let people know early on, this is how death works in this game. Um, and I also give them an idea of like how the villains would work in the game. Um, you know, like if you, you know, if you're some wizard that runs into a, a group of soldiers and you're going to try and fight them all with your staff, like, they're going to butcher you. Yeah. They're soldiers. Yeah. <laughs> you're just some wizard, right? Um, so it's just important to, like, let them know that and uh, give them the opportunity to, uh, to deal with it. So oh. in-game, having them experience it, like, you can prepare them, you say all these things. How do you, pre how do you keep them prepared? Yeah. <laughs> um, so... You attack them early on with something pretty heavy, right? Okay. <laughs> so this is also a fun way to deal with power gaming. Like, oh, you, yeah? You, yeah, you don't fight the power gamer. Just let them make the character like that, and then take a hand or something, right? <laughs> so the, the idea is like you uh, use like uh, critical damage rules or something like that. And again, it depends on the story you're telling. Like, you know, in a, in a Ninja Turtles world, you're going to have like the Foot Clan bumbling around, and you know, you could escape by accident. Uh, even though they're technically trained. Right? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, uh, whereas, like, if you're playing a more kind of first law uh, uh, Game of Thrones world, it's going to be a little bit heavier. And, like, you know, insulting the king to his face as the bard is just going to get you executed. Yeah, exactly. Um, so uh, what I like to do is throw in, like, severe damage rules. In other words, uh, early on, if you take more than half your hit points in, in damage, uh, you roll whatever the relevant save for your game is, so like a fortitude save or something like that. And uh, if you fail it, you go straight to zero hit points. And you have to roll on a critical injury chart to see if like, you lose an eye, you lose a hand, you lose some fingers, you lose your leg. Um, the great part is about this like, is that these scars start to develop the character. Yeah. Right? Like, this is what he learned his first day of battle. This is what she learned on her first day of battle. Like, this is a serious thing. This, like, it's funny because I'm watching your face as you're saying this, yeah. and I'm seeing these memories pop up where yeah. this guy did a thing. And then <laughs> I like love, I love it when that stuff happens. So I th we, we played a game recently where something like that happened. The guy lost the whole back of his calf to an alligator. Oh, man. Um, and it's like minus one to all his like acrobatics checks and stuff like that until he fixes it, and it's not going to be really well, What fixed. about healing potions? Aren't Wait, aren't healing potions supposed to, f like, fill those things and heal scars well, and all restorate, that? like, more like restoration stuff, right? So, like, it's like you're missing a limb. The healing potion doesn't do that, right? The healing potion. And also... Stops you from bleeding out, essentially. <laughs> um, my healing potions uh, also leave scars. Nice. Right? So, like, it heals faster as though it's, like, a natural healing process that's just sped up. Uh, that way they have those because they become part of the story. Like, and I got this character. here and I got this here. Yeah. Right? Um, and it also keeps the, the like, high charisma, super handsome characters. Like, you guys can't get in fights all the time if yeah. you want to stay that way. Or you um, have to be really smooth as a smooth talker. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, you need to talk your way out of those fights. Nice. Um, so I think it's fun to do stuff like that. And, uh, and with the, yeah, again, like, with the power gamer, it's like you, you target them first. Like the six soldiers gang Use up them on them because they look the toughest. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so 
during the game, but then somebody dies. Yeah. How do you cope with that after the game? So. Or during the game, either one. So you can always take a break and talk to someone, right? Something big like that happens. You can literally just say, we have to take a break and I have to talk about it. Um, you can have something planned. Like you can you can think of something that you can do uh, ahead of time that you can pre-write for each character in case they die. <gasps> right. That's a good idea. <laughs> <laughs> mm. um, you can also uh, talk to the other characters about doing something for that character afterwards. In other words, like they can't resurrect him. They don't have the money to yet. Mm-hmm. Um, but they can uh, they can do something for him, and he's always or she is always welcome to roll up the new character, right? And that's something you would say beforehand. Like, right. you could die in this game, I will allow you to roll up a new character, and then we'll fit that character in somewhere right. in the story. Right. That's actually really nice. There's also the potential to resurrect that character as something else in the story. Um, a potential uh, a potential NPC that they could come back and play randomly, <laughs> like a ghost that haunts them or... a are uh, you know resurrected by the bad guy, and now they have to kind of defeat this. That's really cool. So you can find other places for them that kind of are fun and interesting. Uh, I think it's just all, you know, there's exciting creative stuff like with the losing the limbs. Uh, it's at, at first it's scary, but then uh, you're like, wait, I live in a fantasy world. Luke Skywalker lost his hand. Winter Soldier lost his arm. Like yeah. you, you're in a fantasy world. You get like a ghost hand, or you get like a crazy metal arm. Like, like they, they, it can all get better. Okay, so that's a good solution, but then there's the emotions that are attached to it. Mm-hmm. Like when you when you lose a hand, you're automatically some people automatically are upset about the disadvantage that they're going to get. How do you, as a game master, handle the upset about the mechanics? Well, I think again with the Setting up the pregame will ease all of that. Um, and when you get to it, they understood the mechanics, and it's important, you know, when you're playing it, even though that character is part of you, don't take it personally. Like, it's like you weren't out to kill someone. The rules did it, and sometimes this happens. Your character's going into battle all the time. The chance of death was always there. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, and so, uh, you know, sometimes you're just unlucky. I think. Killing some, killing one of the characters for no reason is a bad thing. Um, killing uh, when the char- characters fighting like they're big bad, I'll give them more opportunities, and that's just me like botching roles on the other side of the thing, so mm-hmm. that they can. So because it's the big fight, and because uh, I want that to happen, I want them to be near death. I want them to have that heroic moment. Um, so there's other stuff that you can do on the other side of it to make sure that stuff like that doesn't happen. Uh, but I just don't want the, the random needless death. Like if they yeah. worked for 14 levels to get somewhere and they, you know, they just fail like four or five rolls That's to some the goblins. the worst. Yeah. Oh, it just breaks my heart. But you can make that not happen. Yeah. Um, you have total control over that. Um, so the next subject that we're talking about is boundary crossing. Mm-hmm. So people have these personal boundaries that sometimes they don't let you know, right? Until the until it comes up in game. How do you handle boundaries? So you can ask ahead of time. Does anyone have any topics that are really touchy for them, like that they, they don't want to talk about in this game? Uh, and you can just find that out. And if that's in the game, you can swap it out for something else. Of course, right? yeah. Um, the other is uh, not every story is for everyone. Um, so if it's a core part of your story and it's not for them, let them know, and there's always another game, or they can come back in the game once that er- section's over, uh, or you can tell them when that will occur, um, and you can send them on. You can like write a side mission for them, right? Yeah. So there's a bunch of other ways you can have fun, creative times where they don't have to necessarily be around it, um, and yeah, I think I think talking to them ahead of time is one of the best things that you can do. Um, but then sometimes it comes up and you didn't know that it was going to, and yeah. they didn't know it was going to. And there's always the opportunity to, to pause the game there um, and have a conversation about it. Uh, and, I mean, it's something that they're probably going to have to process. Uh, and I, it really depends on how much you can help them process it. But usually it's not a thing that's in your realm. Yeah, you, it's really hard. <laughs> like you, it was, you, you didn't, if you didn't know it was going to trigger that, and they didn't know, 
mm-hmm. then you know it's just best to give them some space and let them do whatever it is that they have to do to handle it uh, and support them in whatever ways that are necessary. So if something happens at the table, I find that everybody is involved, even if they're just watching. Yeah. How do you do what I call aftercare? How do you do that with the people in your party? I think taking a break to talk about some of the stuff that's going on in the game and also like that's when you can have like a great food break, get some pizza, literally just do something, something to, else. <laughs> to like bring people back together. And then, you know, you don't necessarily have to continue the game that night, right? There's mm-hmm. a, like if it, if it's if it's been kind of halted um, and the momentum doesn't seem to come back, like end the night on a good note, but not necessarily the game. The night is what you want to end on a good note so that they come back, they're excited to play next time. Yeah. Um, but if you kind of try and force it and they're not in the mood, yeah, then... It gets then, messy. Yeah, it gets messy. Characters stop making the decisions they would have made. The roles start getting a little bit slipperier. So I think, um, I think sometimes just recognize when it's over for the night. And be okay with it. Yeah. What are some tools that you have for game masters where you can push them over the edge, but then catch them right before they fall? Great. So one of my one of one thing that's really great to do is to take uh, an experienced player you have and develop a character for the beginning of the game that he knows or she knows from the moment you start the game is going to die early on. Right. They're going to set the pace for the, the fact that death can happen. Uh, it probably will if you're not careful. Uh, and that person knows it ahead of time. They're literally writing a character that can help, and it can also be a plot point for your story. Uh, so when this happens, it triggers more of an adventure to, to occur, right? So that's one thing that you can do, and that definitely sets the tone that, that yeah. it can happen. Right? <laughs> um, the other is that, yeah, you can use uh, just use things to make the game a little bit rougher. Um, I think a lot of people throw out rules like encumbrance, and I love oh, that's the best encumbrance. I love like <laughs> you know like you have Exhaustion, ten thousand gold pieces and you have to like move them somewhere. So uh, th- it adds a little bit of reality to the game. There's like gravity to it. The fact that you find a hundred thousand gold pieces in a in a in a tomb and you have to get it out. It's like now we have to stay here for three days longer while we carry these you know gold <laughs> pieces out, or we have to hide them, or where do you put them in a city? Yeah, right. So there's this idea that like having that kind of stuff can. Uh, can cause all sorts of uh, weird things to happen. They have to like be always on the lookout. They're a little more paranoid. Um, using the uh, using the severe damage rules is great. Again, like all of that stuff can really uh, all of that stuff can really uh, affect and and uh, and help create more character for the characters. Um, and then you know, generally introducing guy ba- uh, ba- uh, villains that they have to flee from. Not villains that they can beat, oh, but villains that cool. can actually beat them up and you know kick them out. Give them that fear, like, oh, right. I'm not the most powerful thing here. Or let the big tough guy in the group get in like a bar fight uh, and lose, nice. right? Just get knocked out cold and thrown out of the bar. Like you're not not the toughest in the city, yeah. Uh, but you can get there. Um, so there's always that kind of stuff. But yeah, you're just trying to just trying to make it a little bit more like they aren't. They, they aren't necessarily the greatest heroes ever yet, but they're building towards it. That's why the experience is there. Yeah. I also like the games where you get to uh, you get experience for failure, not success. Oh, that's There cool. are a bunch of systems where you get experience for failing, uh, and you get no experience for success. But then you make it fun for the players, yeah. too. So it's like you're not just beating them down. You're actually like, okay, these things are happening, giving you character, making your experience at the table more dynamic. Oh, and adding... Uh, adding hero points just so that someone can get out of a nasty situation. So I would give one to uh, to the group per game. They can earn more. Um, uh, hero points are basically uh, for an out there who hasn't used them before. They are points that you can use to automatically roll a twenty, and anyone at the table has access to it. And they can use it. You can also use rules from the um, the Edge of Empire game. It has these force. Um, die, uh-huh. and it, it's got black and white dots on it. And when you roll it, uh, black dots are essentially hero points for the villains, oh, very for the cool. dark side, and lights, <laughs> and and they switch. So if I use my hero point from the light side, the villains get it, and they can use it against me later on. And if oh. the villain uses one, then the heroes get an extra one. So you can kind of bounce them back and forth for a, like this kind of constantly shifting dramatic moments. Oh, that's super fun. Yeah. So I'm going to ask you three questions. Yeah. Are you ready? 
What is your pre-game house rule? Uh, so I think I already went over that, which is that I have the uh, I have the the serious damage stuff going on. <laughs> you're gonna get maimed. Yeah, you're gonna get maimed. <laughs> it's gonna be awesome. What's your favorite GM moment? When I was growing up, we were playing D and D. We had this party that I don't think we thought of it at the time, but it was mostly divine, divinely inspired characters. So like paladins and clerics and things like that. And he took us into the future where all the gods had been slaughtered. And so we had no powers. Oh, like wow. they just had all been defeated. It was like a wasteland and we had to get out of that future. But as, you know, paladins and clerics with no divine magic. So I loved that. <laughs> That's cool. Quick tip to the audience. Uh, quick tip to the audience is make the hero suffer but not needlessly. Nice. That's our show for today. Thank you so much for coming here and joining us. Why don't you tell everyone where we can find you on the internet? You can find me on Instagram at the Nerd Salon. Very cool. As always, I'm Satin Phoenix at Satin Phoenix. You can ask me GM tip questions at hashtag Ask Satine. Pick up and play one of my guild add up supplements for the Tomb of Annihilation at dmsguild.com. Watch me on Geek and Sundry, on Sagas of Sundry Dread, on projectalpha.com. Catch me live every Sunday at noon on Maze Arcana's Orphan Echo on twitch.tv slash Maze Arcana and every Tuesday night, Dungeon Mastering on twitch.tv slash DD. Thank you guys for watching us here on Geek and Sundry, and we'll see you next time. George, would you. GM us out of here. Absolutely. Though you warned him not to, the greedy rogue slides the golden ring onto his finger. The doors seal shut. The rogue looks down as the hidden insectoid legs spring out from the ring and it burrows into his flesh. It's a trap, a replipede. Once the creature takes hold, its magic won't stop until the victim dies. The prisoner begins to laugh and the room starts to shake. Dust and bits of rock fall from the ceiling, and he gets louder and louder. The vibrations get stronger and stronger. If you don't stop him now, the room will come down on your party, crushing them all. His back is turned. You have one chance to save them. What do you do? No! <laughs>